Hello and welcome. My name is Brent Weaver and this is the Digital Agency Show. The podcast that goes behind the scenes with today's top agencies and entrepreneurs. I am really glad you're here and once again, it's time to transform your business mindset. Hey, what's up, digital agency owners and podcast listeners. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to ask you a quick question. Are you currently stressed out, cash crunched, or fed up with your business? If you feel this way, you might think that you have a lead generation problem, or maybe that it's the area you live in, or maybe this market has become too competitive. Maybe you think that your business can't be turned around, and I want you to think again. In my many years of experience, I can tell you now that it's something much deeper that you're likely not even aware of yet. It's like a client who comes to you saying they need a website or Facebook ads or maybe a mobile app developed, but they don't even realize the deeper challenge or opportunity that's blocking them from success. Now, if you'd like to find out what your deeper challenge is, then I want to invite you to apply for a YouGurus strategy call where we'll dig into those underlying issues and get you moving forward like never before. The aha moments will shift the way you think forever and you'll finally get the answers as to why your business hasn't taken off. The number one most important decision to rapidly grow your business starts by booking your strategy call. Go to yougurus.com slash apply to start your application process for this free call. Once again, go to yougurus.com slash apply to get started. All right, let's introduce today's guest. Hey, what's up, podcast listeners, digital agency owners. Welcome to another fantastic week on the Digital Agency Show. Uh, Today, we have um, Paul Boag with us, and he is a leader in digital transformation and user experience design thinking, has over 20 years experience working with clients such as Doctors Without Borders and the European Commission. He is also the author of five books and a well-respected presenter, some of his more recent books specifically about user experience. But for those of us that have been in this business for a while might remember Paul from his uh, book called The Website Owner's Manual, which has been uh, sitting on my shelf for many years. Uh, And so I'm really honored to welcome Paul Boag to our program. Thank you very much for inviting me. The website owner's manual, that takes me back. That makes me, you know, you, you, that's right up there with being a webmaster, isn't it? Do you remember that term we used to talk about? <laughs> I am the webmaster, right? Everybody's, you know, your email yeah. address was not your name. It was webmaster at whatever domain. Exactly. That made, you, made, you felt powerful then, didn't you? Now, now we're just a cog in the wheel, but there was a time when we used to control the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now it's it's so nuanced of the different yeah. seats and teams and, and expertise, yeah. but it was it was nice to be just the webmaster. Um, <laughs> so so take me back maybe um, before maybe b- even before those days, you've been in this business <gasps> for 20 plus years. Uh, yeah. what what was it that originally attracted you to the web? Oh, it doesn't work like that, does it, really? Uh, Careers on, you know, you don't go, oh, I'm going to do this with my life and then do it. Or perhaps other people do, but I certainly didn't. Um, I always wanted to be a graphic designer. Um, And so I went to art college and was doomed to work in McDonald's for the rest of my life. Um, (laughs) But when when I was at um, university studying art, media and design, um, there was a post-it note on the notice board um, that said that IBM was looking for um, uh, a couple of interns, or right, one intern actually, to, to work um, on their first ever multimedia PC. So this was their first PC that had a sound card and a CD-ROM in it. It was very exciting. Um, so I applied for that um, and got down to the last two, um, but failed at the last hurdle. So I didn't actually uh, get that. Um, but then they they changed their minds and took pity on me and decided to take two people instead of one. So I snuck in the back door as the failure. Um, and uh, so I did a year with them. And right towards the end of that year, you know, I spent most of the year designing icons and, and trying to get, you know, video streaming off of a single speed CD-ROM drive where the biggest we could go with the video was 160 by 120 pixels as long as the person didn't move too much in frame <laughs> you know, so, Incredible so it, resolution. it was a totally different oh i know right yeah um so right towards the end of the year um the the team started getting approached by various people within ibm going 
so there's this web thing. Do you do websites? And um, of course, nobody wanted to touch it with a barge pole because, you know, it had no design in it whatsoever. It was gray backgrounds. You know, you couldn't lay out the text. This was before we we worked out you could use tables to slice and dice. They'd only just introduced the image tag. And so what did they do? They gave it to the intern to deal with and not the good intern, <laughs> not the one that they actually intentionally hired, but the kind of second rate intern. And that's how I got into the web. <laughs> I mean, that's a gift, right? I mean, in, in hindsight, the, you know, the thing they gave you was yeah. ended up becoming one of the most valuable human inventions Absolutely. ever on the face of the earth. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. And, and you know, I fell in love with it very quickly. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It, it just kind of fitted. I just love the idea that you could type in some code and something would appear on the screen, you know. And I, it, since being a kid and having my ZX Spectrum, I, did you have ZX Spectrums in America? I think that was a very British thing. Yeah, but a little home, home computer it was with rubber keys, and you plugged it into the TV and loaded programs off of a cassette recorder. And um, yeah, ever since we have one of those in our home, and you know, writing, you know hello world go to line 10 you know and it loops around and says hello world on the screen i i was just you know i loved that kind of stuff so i I was a sucker for anything like that really so was uh was ibm how long were you there was that kind of your uh uh just introduction or did you progress to to someplace else and, and and kind of focus more on the web following that position yeah. So, so after I finished, my, so I had a year there as an intern, then I went back and finished my degree. And, and by that point, the web was beginning to be a thing. We're talking about, I don't know, 95, 96. So most people didn't know about it, but it was more, more of, you know, people were more aware of it. So I went back to um, university and I wrote my dissertation on it and did my final projects around it. And then went back to IBM for uh, probably another three years um, before I then, well, it was 98 that I jumped ship and joined a dot com. That was a very exciting time. The heady days of dot com where, um, you know, everybody was just throwing money. At it, and so so the dot com that I was uh, I joined was six people when I joined, and it was over 120 at its height. Um, and I built up a team of designers there, uh, and helped uh, float the company on the the Nasdaq, um, which was an incredible experience of of going across to America, the first time I'd ever been to America, and meeting with these kind of you know hard nosed Wall Street uh, investors. Who you know? We gave this presentation, and they come up to me afterwards and say, "How does it feel that you're going to be a millionaire by the end of the year?" <laughs> and, and were you? <laughs> uh, no, no, I wasn't. In fact, I was the only person. No, there was out of the 120 of us, there were two of us. I think it was that didn't take stock options. Didn't take. Um, we had the option to buy, and there was only two of us that didn't. And I didn't partly because I had no money. Um, but partly because it just made no sense. The business model was shit, but nobody seemed to care about that. And that was the weird thing. Um, but inevitably the bubble burst. Um, and so I'm massively cynical about anything, anything that doesn't actually make money. So any, any of the kind of Silicon Valley startups, um, I'm very cynical about, um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, and I came came out of that and set up an agency with two of my colleagues from uh, from that dot com. Yeah, and uh, been, I did that for thirteen years before becoming an independent consultant. So a relatively, you know, for the amount of time I've been doing this, not that many different employers, really. You know what's what's crazy, and and this you talking about the dot com thing, uh, which comes up on our show often that a lot of senior people kind of in in this space went through that experience and and we had started our business around that that time but um i mean that was 18 years ago isn't that crazy i mean there's there's a whole oh, generation I'm, of web yeah. professionals right now that prob- that literally did not grow up mm. or um even experience that period and you know i'm wondering if they're listening to the show going god would these would these old guys stop talking about this whole dot com because <laughs> well, I, I feel I like it's, it's so transformative for for a lot of people that went through it like obviously that's still 
that's still hanging with you in terms of your mindset or your view of, of some of these companies yeah. and for good reason, right? Um, and a lot of it is still, is still very, very relevant. I mean, I remember, um, I need to be a bit careful about, I, I'll leave names out of it, but I remember having a, a conversation with um, s- some employees uh, that were working for dig.com at its height. And they were, you know, they were just, it was consuming their lives. It was everything, everything they did from the moment they woke woke up to the moment they went to sleep. And they were living for this miraculous payoff one day where they were going to just walk away with a huge amount of money and they it would enable them to do what they wanted to do. You know, and I kept saying to these guys that you can't just live for the future. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, the, these, these kinds of startups are, are very volatile. You might get lucky. It might all work out, but a lot don't. And you don't hear about the ones that don't. Um, and, and sure enough, you know, Dig really never did kind of come to that magical fruition. And you just think you can't live your life always for tomorrow in the hopes that there's going to be this big payoff. Um, you know, and that's what a lot of people do with these, these kind of startups. And I guess to some degree, you have to do it in order to make something like that a success. But it is a massive gamble at the end of the day. And ever since doing that, ever since going through that, and it, it, it just it ate me up. The dot com, you know, I don't know what what it was like for you, but for me, it just consumed my life and ate me out uh, up and spat me out at the end. And so ever since, my attitude towards business has very much been: I'm going to build a lifestyle business. I'm going to build a business that lets me live the life I want to live now, not for some magical future. So yeah, it was very. Um, very much shaped my attitudes towards work and life really going through that. And I think what's, and I definitely want to come back to this, this lifestyle uh, question, cause that, that's something that comes mm-hmm. up a lot. But I think if I look at your um, body of work, that idea of being present to me, um, it jumps out. I mean, you have, really? you have uh, right. Cause it seems like at every step, you are working on mastering your craft and on um, documenting that through books and through your blog and through your podcast and in speaking and sharing that information. Um, and, and I think it does show some element of being aware of what's happening right now in the space, like what's mm-hmm. useful about the web right now and getting that information out to people, um, not trying to build you know, some billion dollar company or some maybe one day billion dollar company. But I think, you know, being present, I mean, just in, in my personal view of what you've done, um, it does come out in your work. Yeah. I mean, I don't, it's interesting that because, um, for me, the writing and the speaking, and it's funny, I was talking about this only this morning on Twitter, all of that kind of stuff for me isn't, it is primarily my method of learning, right? That if I can explain something to somebody else, then I fully understand it myself. Does that make sense? Um, so, of course, there are other benefits. Of course, you know, it's a great marketing tool and, you know, provides me with lots of opportunities. And actually, people pay me now to, to teach this kind of stuff and write about this kind of stuff. But primarily, it's a learning thing. So what you see from my books and my my blog and my, my speaking is me expressing the things that I'm learning. So, yeah, I guess you're right in a sense. But certainly, I've no no desire to to build uh, a, an empire or or some huge agency i started down that line um and i didn't enjoy it and and actually i went out to lunch with a guy called um joe leach today and he was uh instrumental in building a very big agency over here in the uk um uh, it'd make a great guest to the podcast actually um and he you know they they got to the stage when they had like 300 employees or something like that and he said he just wasn't doing what he loved anymore you know he was managing people and he was selling um so you know uh, th- and that was primarily the same reason that I eventually left Headscape, the agency that I founded and, and went independent was because, you know, I, there was, I didn't want to be doing those kinds of things. I wanted to be, you know, T 
teaching and infusing and exciting people. Because at the end of the day, I love the web. I love the idea of user experience. I love the idea of design. I love the idea of creating amazing experiences for people. Um, uh, or no, not even a, a bar that high, not creating amazing experience. I just want to, I want to take hassle out of people's lives. You know, everybody goes on um, uh, social media, all oh, hashtag first world problem, right? As if, you know, first world problems, oh, it's so trivial and insignificant. But we live in a culture that is full of stress. None of us have got enough time. And if I can just take some of those rough edges off of people's lives, that makes me happy. Um, and yeah, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be spending my life building some mega business. I want to make people's lives just that little bit easier. So you've, you've mentioned lifestyle, uh, business or you've designed your business around your lifestyle. How, um, I feel like everybody has their own definition of what that means. What, what is a lifestyle business to you? Um, well, a lifestyle business is a business that facilitates your lifestyle. Um, <laughs> sure, so, sure. But what, 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 what is, how what, have you, what is my yeah, lifestyle? exactly. Yeah. Um, for me, um, uh, that's a really good question. So let's be honest that you, you want to earn a certain amount of money. There's a certain amount of money that covers your overheads, gives you enough um, uh, money to to go on holiday or buy the latest app or device that, that you've been indoctrinated to buy. Um, but there's also then the degree of flexibility. That's a big one for me that, that, you know, if I get up one morning and I don't fancy working, I don't need to work and that's okay. I can survive a day or two of not doing anything. Or if I want to take a few months off and go traveling, I can do that. Or, you know, so there's those kinds of flexibility elements um, and then there is uh, family um, and getting to spend um, time doing those kinds of things, um, uh, which is, you know, and, and spending time. We homeschool our, our son. And so, you know, that that obviously has got a load of baggage with it in terms of uh, being available for him and, and helping him with his education and being there for uh, my wife, who, who does the vast majority of that um, kind of work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's those kinds of things really. Um, but the trouble is, is so often people set up businesses, um, intending to create a lifestyle business and wanting all of those things that I've just listed, but they, they end up creating a monster that needs feeding. You know, it's a bit like Seymour from, um, <laughs> the, oh yeah. Feed me Seymour, right? You know, like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it's, you know, and, and I think our business is quickly turned into that. And so it is very much about taking control of the business and making sure that, you know, it, it facilitates your needs rather than you existing to facilitate it. And, and kind of that same thing that you were talking about with the big exit of really working and, and imagining that one day this will pay off. I mean, the same thing can easily happen to somebody that has the intention of creating a lifestyle business as they say, you know, one day I'll be able to take all the vacation I want, or one day this thing will finally work for me. And then they wake up maybe one day like Joe and they realize they have 300 employees and they're not doing what they want to do. Yeah. I mean, the best example I ever saw of that was um, when we when we ran Headscape. Um, we always wanted a lifestyle business. We wanted a, a business that facilitated our lives now. But one of the, we had a non-executive director who was much more ambitious than we were. And uh, he was a really good guy and gave some really solid advice. But he was always pushing us, always pushing us to, you know, oh, think about your exit strategy. You know, how are you going to sell this business in five years and go and do what, you, you know, something else? Because that's how he ran his business and that's how he thought. Now, that was, and he was incredibly successful at doing that. He worked very, very hard, but he was building something that was really quite impressive and had a lot of potential. And it was going really well, right up to the point that his 10 year old son got cancer. And, you know, and he came to, we got, had a conversation when he was in the middle of all of this with his son saying, you know, I, uh, you know, you were right. You've got to live for the day. You, you know, I was working and working. I wasn't spending some time with my son and now potentially I'm going to lose him, you know, and I, you know, I, I've missed out on his life. Now, fortunately his son was fine and recovered, but it, it kind of shows you that, 
all, all the best planning could be for nothing, planning for a long-term future. And I'm not saying you shouldn't think about your future. Of course you should. And of course you should have a direction for it. But it can't be too much at the expense of the moment. Otherwise, life will just throw you some random curveball that that um, that just destroys your plans. Do you know what I mean? So it's a very it's a tricky balance, I think. This whole lifestyle versus of today and long term lifestyle of the future. But I I lean towards the let's create a good lifestyle today. Any tips for our listeners about how you keep yourself in check on that? Um. I think some of it is about um, knowing what you want um, as you go in and being very honest about that. So I, I mentor a lot of agencies actually these days. or uh, And I talk to these people and one of the first questions I ask is, well, what do you want? What do you want to achieve running your business? A lot of people don't really know because they've just kind of fallen into it. Other people have lost sight of the original reasons that they wanted. And then other people are, are, are just kind of deluding themselves. So one a common answer that I, I often get back is I want to build something in you know big i want to build an agency now some people truly mean that some people actually do get this this huge satisfaction about building something successful and that's absolutely fine um but then there are other people when you dig into that there's an underlying reason right they want to build a big business because they want to earn more right or they want more respect um and actually, you need to know what the underlying reason is because I've earned more as a freelancer or as an independent consultant with that I am today than I ever did running an agency because I've got less overheads. Okay. Um, and equally built getting respect you can get through writing books, doing podcasts, other things. So so you kind of got to really know what you want. Um I mean, I actually wrote a blog post on this. There's 10 lessons that I've learned for running a successful web design business. And that's where I start. I start with that one. But you you get onto all kinds of other things, you know, being properly in control of your business finances. I'm I'm constantly shocked how few agency owners actually have got a real handle in their heads, you know, around that kind of stuff. Um, then there's things about people not really putting the effort into marketing and promoting their agencies. They they kind of rely on work just walking through the door, um, which I always it terrifies me as well because you know that makes it very hard to plan for the long term. It's always hand to mouth, which is never good, and so it goes on. So you were uh, running or co-founded or founded a Headscape for, and you ran mm. that business for 13 years. Decided that mm-hmm. that was no longer a fit for you. Um, Mm -hmm. What was, I guess, your, your wake up for that? I mean, you just realized, Hey, this is not supporting my lifestyle and I'm going to, I'm going to jump ship. How did that transition go? So, I mean, it's a, okay. There were a a couple of things. Um, One is that um, my lifestyle changed, right? Because we started homeschooling our son and various other factors as well. So what I wanted was different now than it was. So as a result, Headscape wasn't delivering that for me. But obviously, you don't kind of just drop things, especially when you co-found it. You know, screw you guys. (laughs) You know, it doesn't give me what I want anymore. I'm out of it. I mean, this is so Um, important, too, because I know that people have founded companies at some time in the past, and at some point, maybe their life demands different things from them. I mean, I know my... Mm. My personal life has changed dramatically with having two kids since I founded our company yeah. five years ago. I mean, there are things that are going on now in my life that I could not have fathomed five years ago. Yeah, absolutely. See, and you do need to, you know, I check in regularly. And I, and I was at Headscape, right? When I, when I first started to get a bit antsy, um, which was probably, to be honest, about I don't know, seven years in, maybe something like that. You started to go, you got past the honeymoon period and you, you know, it was every day. So I set myself an annual task to to just ask a simple question. Am I still happy at Headscape? And year in, year out, I'd basically go, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Really enjoy it. Then my my circumstances changed a bit and it's, well, yeah, it's, it's still right. It's still okay. And every year would go by and I'd ask the same question. And then we we went through a rough financial time. Um, 
and uh, we were struggling in the business and, uh, you know, was, uh, the pressure of bringing in enough work was going up and it was getting harder and harder. Um, and, and then we recovered a little bit and it was better. And then it got worse again. And, you know, so it was all a bit roller coastery. And so I, we got to a point where we looked like for the first time we might actually have to let, let staff go. And all three of us had a pathological hatred for doing that. Um, leftover, actually, ironically, from the dot-com days where we ended up in this bizarre situation at the end where we were we were basically hatchet men going into companies and firing people. And I won't bore you with why we ended up in that situation, but it was, a, it was the worst thing any of us had had to do in our lives. It was just awful. So we all had this really deep hatred of doing it. And I basically said to myself and to my colleagues, look, if it comes to that, I'm the first one under the bus, right? I couldn't do it. I couldn't, you know, if I was going to fire other people, I wanted to fire myself as well. Um, so effectively, that's what I did. Um, and actually, Headscape rebounded great after that, um, having, you know, not having um, a third director with a, you know, uh, uh, the, the salary and the, 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 all the stuff that goes with that, um, was just what it needed. It, we did have to let, I think, two people go, um, at the time. Um, but it's re recovered really well. And I, you know, and that's great. And I'm still a non-executive. I still sit on their board. I still provide them with advice. You know, I still point clients in their direction because they're a really good agency. Um, but I've stepped back from the day to day running. So it was a kind of it was a funny combination, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean that's very. Um, I mean, a, a lot of uh, partnerships with two or three partners um, that might be going through one of those situations. I mean, I know many that have uh, gone out of business before one partner will leave. Right? That that mm. uh, they aren't able to weather that storm. They've got too many cooks in the kitchen and too many, you know, uh, top end salaries, and ultimately they crash and burn because the partners can't agree. So, I mean, that's that's. I commend you for saying, "Hey, if this is going to yeah. go through a rough patch, I'm and I'm not in it a hundred percent." Because life circumstances have changed or wants have changed, then you know to be able to stand up and, and step away. I mean, a lot of people uh, would enter that. Uh, I don't know. You mentioned the, the honeymoon period had passed. Maybe you guys were at the uh, the TV dinner uh, watching uh, Jeopardy <laughs> stage. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, we were a bit going through the motions. I think it was a, it, it, it turned into that monster that we needed to feed, um, which didn't make me feel comfortable i mean they're not like that anymore it's you know because they've been able to reduce their overheads and make ver various other changes uh, you know it's it's a much nicer working environment now but something needed to change you know we'd had two three years of it feeling like a hard slog um and you know what they say the first sign of madness is doing the same thing <laughs> and expecting different results you know something something had to happen um, and it seemed like the most logical. And of the three of us, I was a bit of an outlier anyway, um, in the sense that because I built the, the personal profile that I'd ha I had and, and my interests were actually diverging a little bit from the company as well, that, you know, uh, Headscape it delivers web solutions. It builds websites. You know, that's what it does. While I'd moved into... Kind of business consultancy and and you know digital transformation and user experience and all of these other areas. So my shifting had kind of moved. Um, so it made sense that I was the one really. So it wasn't some altruistic. I threw myself on the sword. It was just you know basically it came down to I drew a line in the sand and I said if we're going to lose, there was one client that we really looked like we were going to win. They'd said we were going to win. The CEO of the company said we were going to win the work. And that would have meant that we wouldn't have had to lay people off. And so I drew a line in the sand at that point and said, well, if we don't win that client, then, then I'll go. And sure enough, we didn't. So it was that push you needed. Because it's very hard to leave something behind, you know, and do something that's unknown. I mean, you know, I'm sure everybody listening to this, if they've 
at some stage they've walked away from a job to start an agency and that's a really hard thing to do you know you don't walk away from a stable income do you <laughs> I, I know that that's i mean we've had several people uh on the program that have have made that jump and it, it is definitely hard or or they've had an agency and they've built a product or have an idea for a product because they've been building stuff for other people for 10 years and then they're, yeah. they're thinking well maybe i should build something for myself and and uh you know i think that 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 leap or that gap i mean it shows up all in all sorts of places so one thing i mean you, you've mentioned you user experience a few times and I because this is your uh, your current superpower um, I, I, I would feel a disservice to our audience if we didn't uh, introduce them to some of your viewpoints on, on user experience um, how agencies can leverage this I mean I when I hear people say user experience and sometimes it comes in the form of you know UX UI designer or whatever I, I feel like it's one of those uh, misinterpreted or misunderstood uh, disciplines. Like one time, one day we had, uh, this is from my agency. We had a designer on our team and you know, she was a, a designer, web designer. And then one day she came in and said, Nope, I'm a UI UX designer. I was like, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know, just put it, put it, whatever you want on your card, you're still doing the same work. Right. Um, and, but yeah. I know that there are, cause I, I've spent a lot of time with companies that just do user experience. Um, yeah. that there is a deep study here, uh, so maybe just give our, our audience a quick like definition of what you think user experience is and um, and how this can potentially fit into an agency's business model. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, that, that, oh, I'm a UI UX designer is a common thing. And they are, really are two discipli- different disciplines. Um, a UI designer, um, UI design is a subset of user experience design which is a subset of customer experience design, all right, is the way to think about it. So uh, to to take an example, let's um, say you were working on an e-commerce site um, and you were building an e-commerce experience. And um, as part, a, a UI designer would create an amazing website, right? And it'll have great calls to action. It'll be easy to use. Um, it'll be an amazing experience. That's where a UI designer stops. It's, they stop at the edge of the screen, if you like. A UX designer will go to the company and will say, yeah, but have you thought about offering a 365-day return policy? Or what's your email um, uh, campaign like when somebody abandons their shopping basket? Or, um, you know, is the, the, the process of returns easy or, you know, and so it goes on. Um, I mean, you just, you just so, like blew my mind just now. I just want to tell you that because, because I've heard really? so many people say, oh, I'm a UX, I'm a user experience designer, but I've never heard those folks that are really, you know, they're really front end designers, people that are doing, <laughs> you know, the UI, like you said, um, I've never heard them come in and talk about you know, like you just said, like a, a return policy or or the things yeah. that are happening in the business that affect the customer, affect the user with their use of the website or how they're using it or or the you know the conversion rate stuff like that. I've never I I just personally have not seen many people go beyond the pixels, the actual experience on the page. It's actually a very logical transition. Um because if you're a UI designer and you're listening to this, right? Think about all those times where you've got frustrated delivering a website, all right? Um, Because the content's rubbish. Or uh, another another classic example. I work with a client who, an e-commerce site again, and they they didn't want to show prices on their e-commerce site. And I was like, what? Uh, We only show prices once someone's entered a postcode, you know, and as a UI designer, this was quite a long time ago, you know, when I first started working to them, you go, all right, then, you know, that that's a constraint on the project, isn't it? But it creates a crappy user experience. Now, it turns out that the reason for that is because they operate a a, a franchise operation. Okay. And um, which means that every different franchise across the country can set its own prices. So they don't know the price until someone enters their postcode and says where they live. Right. Now, as a UI designer, you, you kind of shrug your shoulders and go, well, that's a constraint. I'm kind of stuck with that. Um, 
but I got progressively fed up with those constraints. You know, those constraints that said, oh, you can't do that because we can't build that on our content management system, or you can't do that because that's not how our business operates, or you can't you can't have the content yet because it's got to be approved by three different people across the organization, right? And so I just, I reached a point where I started to go, well, screw that for a game of soldiers. Um, you know, that's not, uh, I'm not having it. <laughs> um, and I started to interfere. Um, and that's how I kind of moved beyond the user interface into the things that impact the user interface. So, you know, eventually with that company for a start, the first step was I said, well, why don't we just show the highest price by default? And then when people enter their postcode, suddenly we can offer them a discount, right? Ooh, oh, we never <laughs> thought of doing that. It's like some kind of you know? web magic you just pulled there, right? Exactly. And, and and so they, oh, all right. And then eventually, little by little, over a five-year period, it didn't happen quickly, um, we got them to a point where they, they had universal pricing. They had separate website pricing. Um, you know, and so the, all of these problems, another one is, you know, when they tell you, when, when a company says, uh, okay, we've got this contact form and we've got to have, you know, uh, we need to ask for people's inside leg measurement because we want that for marketing purposes. you know, And we sit and grumble and we moan about that as user interface designers, but we reluctantly put it in. The user experience designer says, well, okay, what are you going to do with that data that you're collecting? And you know, how uh, is that worth the business trade-off? And looks at you know, the, the, the impact of having that versus not having it and, whether, and turn that into a financial figure that we can discuss. And, you know, and so it's pushing beyond the confines of what you consider your job to be into areas that maybe are, are not, you know, necessarily what you, um, you know, what you envisaged initially. And it's really worth doing because there's good money in this kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, because you, you're moving from being somebody who delivers a website, which to be honest, increasingly these days is a commoditized business um, uh, to a point where you're offering consultancy services. Now, now you could charge consultancy rates, you know, and, and so that really, it, it can be quite transformational for your business. Because the truth is, is that delivering of websites is becoming, um, you're very much squeezed. So at the top end of the market, you've got large organizations that are now bringing their, their website development in-house, so um, that's forcing top-end agencies to move down the market. At the bottom end of the market, you've got things like Wix and Squarespace or hell, even a Facebook page that are enough for small businesses. And that's pushing those ones up the market and everyone's getting squeezed in the middle. So I kind of just stepped out of the game and said, well, okay, so I'm going to offer something different. So actually, I'll run a, an entire um Day's workshop. I occasionally run it online, which is how to start offering kick-ass, you know, user experience services, and just and start layering in that alongside your design and development work, and slowly kind of shifting towards that more consultative offering. So this is something an agency, if they were, I mean, look, what you've just talked about, I mean, even, uh, I mean, it was a big aha for us when I was running my agency that we were, I, I was always very much asking questions about what a client wanted the website to do. What functions do you want? Yeah. What features? And I, I had an expectation that the client had uh, done this work or done this thought about that. And, and eventually I started mm -hmm. shifting the conversation more to, well, tell me about your business. Tell me about your organization. What are you guys trying mm -hmm. to accomplish? What are the problems you're solving with this website? And then we'll, we'll figure out um, the right solution for that. And it sounds like in a way, user experience has kind of become the study of what happens outside of the actual website, how it impacts that and that's obviously a very high value um, expertise. And other agencies yeah. can, can bring this into uh, their service offering in a language that their customer um, maybe can understand or maybe they come in saying, hey, we want somebody to do user experience. Now there's at least a name for it. But what's really ironic is there'll be a lot of people listening to this who'll be say, saying to themselves, well, I do all of that. Right? I asked all of those questions. So, you know, I, I talked to clients about all of this at the beginning of the business but they do it for free. Mm. We do it. We naturally do it as part of our kind of kickoff process because you can't design a good interface unless you've discussed and talked about, you know, business objectives, user needs, all of this kind of stuff. 
but we rarely charge it charge for that kind of thing you know and and you can you know this is this is services that we should be charging for not just the end deliverable people you you should be charging for the knowledge that's in your head not just for a website because like i say you know squarespace you could build a website on squarespace or shopify or any of these systems for you know a fraction of the that's not where your value comes from a, a guy in the back bedroom can do that right what they can't do, what they don't have is those use, years of experience of understanding why users do what they do and understanding what businesses need to do to appeal to a generation of, of, of users that aren't like previous generations, that are more demanding, that are um, have got higher expectations. Um, so that's that's where I'm interested is, you know, is in, in you know, uh, helping organizations uh, provide the level of service that users have come to expect. That's fascinating. So how would this, so we talk about discovery in our program a lot and, um, you know, we don't just peg it to, this is just about user experience. Um, you know, we talk about the overall business discovery and in the website or project discovery and going through that either in a paid or unpaid fashion as part of your, your sales, uh, process. Um, but obviously if you're going to go through and add a a scope item to your next project that says user experience and you have a handful of things that you're going to be doing during that time, I mean, I imagine, um, doing user interviews would be an example of that actually going yeah. in and interviewing people that might be using this uh, type of, of service. Um, so is that what you recommend in general is for agencies to first understand what user experience is, how to package it, how to deliver it, and then how to mm-hmm. sell that into the service offering if they're not already or, you know, communicate it better because they're already doing it? Yeah. I mean, I, the first thing that I, I recommend is that you, right, you, you, get, you get a brief, don't you, from a client. And almost always that brief's pretty rubbish um, because a lot of times the people that are writing these briefs are not digital professionals. They don't know what they're, you know, what needs to be in there. Um, and you end up with a stack load of questions, right? And what we do is we, we then start into this long, prolonged process of asking all of these questions to our, our potential customer Um which either we do on our own dime or we try and persuade them at that point that, well, hang on a minute, we need to do a discovery phase at the beginning of the project. And as soon as you say a discovery phase, immediately, it, well, for a start, most people don't know what you mean. And then you try and explain it and you say things like, well, it's for us to better understand uh, the business and so we can provide a better solution. So hang on a minute, I'm having to pay you to learn about us and not get anything back from it that sounds a bit shit right <laughs> so what what i tend to do is i go into if i get a brief where where obviously they've not done any of the discovery phase the user interviews the user research the business goals if they haven't done that kind of stuff i go back in and say look guys um you are going to find, you know, you're going to find when you get back quotes, a huge variance in the um, uh, the quotes that you get back. And the reason you're going to find that is because, you know, the brief that you've provided is very much open for interpretation. There are lots of different ways you can go about doing this. Um, and And so you're going to be comparing apples with oranges. It's going to be really hard for you to know where you stand. And actual fact, you may well not end up with what you need at the end of all of that because there's a um, there's not the underlying research that needs to happen. So I want to propose a different way of working, right? I don't want you to spend 30 grand with me on a website. I'll just pick that number randomly out of the air. But let's say that was, you know, ballpark where it. I don't want you to spend 30 grand with me on this website because to be quite frank, I don't know enough to provide you with a great solution for that budget. Instead, I want you to hire me to uh, spend five grand, right? And I want to spend that five grand putting together a clear 
outline of what needs to be delivered. And, and I will do user research for that. I will do stakeholder interviews for that. I'll do all the things going to a discovery phase, basically, and deliver for you at the end of that a specification of what needs creating. Now, at that point, you've got a choice, okay? You could go, do you know what? That was a really painful process putting that together. I really don't like Paul. He was a bit of a dick. <laughs> I'm going to go somewhere else, or I'm going to take that out to tender or whatever, right? Or alternatively, you get to the end of it and go, working with Paul was great. It was a brilliant experience. He really obviously now understands the business. I want him to go ahead and do the rest of the project. Right. So the client likes it because they're going to end up with a specification that builds what they really need and not a load of things that they wish they had or think they might have or get convinced by an agency they require. Right. Um, and also, they've got a tangible deliverable that they can take to other people if they want to, and they get to try out the relationship with you rather than committing themselves to the whole thing. It's like going on a first date. You know, they get to try it out rather than get married to you. So oftentimes that actually works quite well. And people are, are kind of quite open to that way of working um, because it, it, it sets them up with a firm foundation for what is often quite a big financial commitment for their company of, of building a new website. I think that's a fantastic way to um, reposition discovery and, um, mm. and and speak a lot more in clear deliverables, not just saying, hey, at the end of discovery, you're going to get a proposal, right? Of actually giving yeah. them, you know, some of that information, helping them close that uh, knowledge gap on their own on business and own website and own users. Um, that's fantastic. Paul, this has been uh, probably one of my most uh, fascinating conversations of, of 2018. I just want to give you props. Um, are you uh, are you ready for our lightning round? Yeah, let's let's do it. All right. What is the best advice you've ever received? Um, actually, bizarrely, it's it, it wasn't said directly to me. Um, it's a quote that I have built my life around. Um, and it's uh, a quote by Winston Churchill and has summed up my attitude, certainly to running my own business, um, but also working with clients and organizations and personally as well. And it's a quote that it says, success is going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Um, and especially when you're running your own business, that tenacity of keeping going, um, you know, no matter how many times you fall over is, is so, so important. And it's very important with sales as well um, to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep trying. That's great. Which of your personal habits has contributed most to your success? <laughs> Irrepressible enthusiasm. <laughs> very good. I once had... I once had a client said to me, I was, I, I went off on one in a meeting about some new feature or something that I wanted to build for them. And I was getting more and more agitated and more and more excited. Oh, we could do this. And, ah. and he turned around to me at the end and he said, Paul, how could I say no to you? It would be like kicking a puppy. <laughs> And that's, I love that that's, um, I mean, I would have guessed, you know, you can never peg somebody's personal habit, but I, I would have guessed, you know, something around writing, right? Because I feel like you're a, 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 an avid writer, right? That that's obviously something that you do, but I love that, that enthusiasm is, is what you think of, right? That's great. Yeah. And to, for my mind, you know, writing is literally just an output of my enthusiasm. You know, is me, my irrepressible desire to get excited about whatever it is that, that causes me to write. Because truthfully, you know, at school, I was a horrendous writer, you know, awful, awful. My grammar, my spelling, you know, I was, I, I had real problems with it to the point where I, you know, I went to go and see the special person to help me with it. Um, and, and, and if you look back at my very early blog posts, they're boring and crap. The only reason I've got good at writing is because I'm too enthusiastic not to write. 
<laughs> That's great. I love that it's it's connected, right? I mean, it's you're literally mm-hmm. like overflowing with things that you need to tell the world. So that's that's a channel. Um, can you share an internet resource or a tool that you use regularly that our listeners would find valuable? Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? Um, are we talking about listeners from a, from a point of view of running your own business? You can take it wherever you want. We've heard some surprising okay. things on this program. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, um, I'm a huge fan of getting things done as a way of organizing myself. David Allen's book, which I'm sure someone's already said about. So I won't say that. Notice how I managed to slip in an extra one there. I think the tool that I have found most useful for running my business on a day-to-day basis is a tool called Pipedrive, pipedrive pipedrive.com. And it's, um, it's a very, very simple customer relationship management system. Um, so basically it enables me to see month by month, um, what potential work is upcoming. Um, and it, it, it ensures I chase and follow up with clients and I persevere with them going back to that success is going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Um, and to chase them and to, to engage with them and, to um, talk with people. So I found Pipe drive, very, very useful. That was the first thing that popped into my head anyway. Yeah, it's a great platform. Uh, big fan. Uh, and finally, uh, what book would you recommend and why? And you can't uh, plug your own book. We'll, we'll link to all your books in our show notes. I guess you could go with the classic um, uh, Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think, Ooh. Um, uh, which is a brilliant book on, on um, usability testing. Um, there's his follow-up book, which maybe is a bit more practical in terms of how to actually do it. The first book is why you should be doing usability testing. His second book, which is called Rocket Surgery Made Easy, um, is more practical about how to run usability testing. But there's so many. Undercover Undercover UX is a really great or user experience by um, Kenneth um, Bowles. Uh, um, is is a really good book as well. I mean, so many. I can't choose. Well, That's a cruel question. Don't, don't make me think is is definitely one of my favorites. Every new person that worked at our agency, we that was the first bit of required reading that we get, gave them. Yeah. So big big fan of that. Yeah. Uh, Paul, how can our audience find out more about you? And is there anything that you have that they can check out? <laughs> is there anything that I have that they can check out? Um, okay. So obviously my website, boagworld.com. Um, I mentioned earlier a blog post um, about uh, kind of things that I'd learned running my own agency. So I'll send you that afterwards and you can shove that in the show notes. I'll also send you the slides for my um, workshop, Becoming a User Experience Agency. So at least, I mean, it's not the same as it looking at slides, but you, you know, you can have a little look through those. Um, and then there's my podcast, um, which is uh, the Boag World UX show. Um, which is boagworld.com forward slash show, which is the longest running web design podcast because I didn't know when to start. <laughs> well, congrats on that title. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a big deal in of itself. Uh, there is so much content that you have put out there on uh, on helping agencies grow, on UX, on the web, on um, how to do this craft that we're all Uh, intimately engaged with better and uh, just want to thank you for what you've done for our industry Paul and you've also been a fantastic guest uh, for us on this program yeah you do a very professional podcast I'm you know you you sound like a like you really know what you're doing unlike mine where we all just kind of waffle and and argue a lot so well done on that totally (laughs) totally making this up as we go so I appreciate that Paul (laughs) very nice well uh, thanks again Paul uh Uh, listeners um, that's it for our show this week Uh, stay tuned each and every week for more great content coming at you on how to grow your digital agency until then I'm Brent Weaver thanks again for tuning in to the digital agency show before we close out I wanted to check in on your answer to my question from the beginning of the episode 
Are you stressed out, cash crunched, fed up with your business? Now, if you feel this way, you might think that you have a lead generation problem. Maybe that it's the area you live in or that this market has gotten too competitive. Maybe you think that your business can't be turned around. And I want you to think again. In my many years of experience, I can tell you now, it's something much deeper that you're likely not even aware of yet. It's like a client who says they need a website, Facebook ads, or a mobile app when they don't even realize it's a deeper challenge that's blocking them from success. Now, if you'd like to find out what your deeper challenge is, then I want to invite you to apply for a strategy call where we're going to dig into those underlying issues in your business and get you moving forward like never before. The aha moments that you're going to have will shift the way you think forever, and you'll finally get the answers as to why your business hasn't taken off. The number one most important decision to rapidly grow your business starts by booking your YouGurus strategy call today. Go to yougurus.com slash apply to start the application process for this free call. Once again, go to yougurus.com slash apply to get started. Thanks again for tuning in. Join us next week for another episode of the Digital Agency Show. 